glad that you're here today, and I am so honored to be part of this group, and to be part of this group for almost the last 10 years. Um, you guys have been so warm, so welcome, and it's now a real privilege for me to welcome all of you to my neck of the woods here in the Bay Area, because I live basically right across the bay, and so I hope everyone gets to enjoy um, the Northern California Bay Area while you're here in town. So today um, we're going to talk a little bit about Costello Syndrome and how everyone now fits into a larger family um, of the RAS pathway uh, syndromes. So and so much has happened since the last time we met in Portland and I just want to remind you that it's only been two years ago where we all were in Portland and we had our very first international um, Costello Syndrome Research Symposium where we spent the entire day with international clinicians and researchers talking about Costello Syndrome and how we can move the research and the best practices for the kids forward. And we had, again, speakers from all over the world where we were talking about the new gene discovery of HRAS and we brought all the researchers together to start thinking about the possibility of treatment and clinical trials. And the favorite part of the entire day was the very important keynote speakers that we had um, two years ago. And they really kicked off that day and really set the pace for what we did um, two years ago. And I also want to take a step back, just as what Tammy was saying, with regards to where Costello syndrome has been going. And when you look at this, this is just a schematic, a diagram of the number of papers that have been published um, throughout the years. And if you look at it, that in 1977, this is when um, Dr. Costello first published the paper on Costello syndrome, but it wasn't named Costello syndrome at that time. And then it was basically rediscovered, in quotes, um, in 1991 by Dirk Klaustian et al. And that's when, it, that's when all the interest really sparked. It had to be rediscovered and put into the literature. And then you can see that the last one in uh, 2008 uh, and 9, you can see how 25 papers, when you combine that year, how it's really grown. And I'm telling you, this is just the beginning. So what is the RAS pathway and why is it so important? Over the last several years, you've heard RAS, RAS, RAS. What's the gene? Well, what in the heck is the RAS pathway and why is it so important? Well, the human body is made up of trillions and trillions of cells. And those cells need to communicate with each other and with the environment. So here is a cell. You have the cell membrane, and you have the nucleus, and you have the inside of the cell, and you have the outside of the cell. So what the RAS pathway does is you actually have a signal from the outside of the cell, which basically touches the cell. It signals to the cell itself. And the cell has a receptor in the cell membrane, and that receptor picks up the telephone and gets the signal. Then there is a bucket brigade inside of the cell where you literally, literally have one signal going to another signal, going to another signal, going to another signal. And then there's RAS. RAS truly is the center of that signaling hub. It is so important that in fact it's so important that there's multiple RASs inside that cell. That's how important RAS is. And then RAS, once it gets the signal, it tells the cell what it's supposed to do. It tells the cell whether or not it's supposed to divide. It tells the cell whether or not it's supposed to differentiate or become unique among a sea of cells. It can tell the cell, you know what? We're getting geared up here. We need you to make more cellular components. So it tells the cell to make cellular components. It tells the cell, you know what? It's time to start moving. You need to move, get moving. And it can tell the cell whether or not it's supposed to survive or whether or not it's supposed to die. So that is the RAS pathway. And in fact, the RAS pathway is so important that at the end of all those little color sticks, that is 
represents one member of the RAS family. That right there represents the RAS superfamily. And here's HRAS, KRAS, and NRAS right in that RAS superfamily. That's how important RAS is. So why is it so important again? Well, it's been studied in the context of cancer. Um, and so what has been identified is that there's abnormal RAS signaling, this very important cellular pathway, in over 30% of the cancer study. So that's important. But the good news is, because the RAS pathway is so important, and it has been an intense area of focus, that there are already many drugs that are targeted to this pathway. So, again, to remind you, here's the RAS pathway and what it does. But when the RAS pathway is, is altered, all the things like dividing cells and to differentiate and to make cellular components or just tell the cell to move or tell the cell whether or not to survive or die, that can get a little dysregulated. It functions, but it functions just a little differently. So here's the representation of the RAS pathway with all of its correct components here. And so this is basically just like the schematic, but now we've added in the components. And this is, these are the components that have been found altered in the family of syndromes of the RASopathies. So here they are. This is, these are your kissing cousins right here. So you have neurofibromatosis 1. You have Noonan syndrome, Leopard syndrome, which is a very close cousin of Noonan syndrome, gingival fibromatosis 1 is part of the pathway, capillary malformation, AV malformation syndrome, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome is part of the pathway, Costello syndrome, right in the middle there, cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome, and the new kid on the block is leg use syndrome. So we're here to talk about Costello syndrome and how Costello syndrome fits into the rest of the pathway. But I want you to remember something, that Costello syndrome truly is the center of the RAS MAPK pathway, right there in the middle. And today you guys are going to have wonderful talks from people from all around who are going to talk about the issues of Costello syndrome, talk about the neurological issues. Um, Dr. Audrey Foster Barber is going to talk about the enlarged ventricles, tethered cord, KR malformation. As you know, the heart and the cardiovascular system is, the system is also involved with Costello syndrome, and Dr. Angela Lin is going to talk about that. Growth and development, very, very important. And now that you've seen all that what the RAS pathway does, you can see how growth and development can be affected. You're going to hear about failure to thrive in the natural history from Ginny Proud, how short stature with growth hormone deficit and hypoglycemia and puberty could be affected. Dr. Dan Doyle is going to talk about that. And uh, Dr. Marty Axelrod is going to talk about motor delay and speech delay. And you're going to hear about how all of this can actually affect um, uh, how your child undergoes anesthesia because it's really important, all the anatomy and the physiology of the kids. And Dr. Michael Lennis is going to talk to you about that. And you all know about the special skin findings in Costello syndrome, and Dr. Don Siegel will be uh, talking about that with you today. And the eyes, of course, um, are affected with strabismus, nystagmus, astigmatism, and so forth. And Dr. Shuma Shanker will be talking to you about that. And as you all are very well aware, that Costello syndrome can be associated with um, cancer. And Dr. Bronwyn Kerr will be speaking about that. And one thing, of course, to remember is as the children get older, there are special issues in adulthood. Um, how the body changes, how this affects activities of daily living. And uh, Dr. Sue White and Beth Hopkins will be mentioning that. And of course, how the bones can lose minerals. And Dr. Dave Stevenson will be mentioning that. And it's so nice to have uh, Dr. Stevenson here because he's come over. He's going to come to the bright side. He's from the dark side, NF1. And we're bringing him <laughs> over into, into the light. So you all have heard about HRAS. We talked about it uh, two years ago, and you're going to hear more about it today. And basically, the bottom line is HRAS, which you now know is a very important gene in, our, in every single cell in our body, 
There is a genetic alteration that causes Costello syndrome, with the majority of the genetic alterations happening in the first coding exon, um, in, in well over 80% of the individuals, with a, with a handful having different mutations and different genetic alterations in a different part of the gene. But we, I really want to focus the rest of the talk on Costello syndrome and how it's become a member of a family. And why that's so important is because learning about other syndromes in this family of syndromes will help us learn more about Costello syndrome. And for example, NF1, neurofibromatosis. So neurofibromatosis, just in a nutshell, is relatively easy to diagnose because it has very special skin findings, which a lot of physicians can recognize. These children or individuals can have these larger birthmarks called cafe au lait macules, and they can be all over the body. They can have what's called uh, freckling in the skin folds in both the axilla and in the groin region. It's called fold freckling. And these particular individuals get neurofibromas. They're very different from papillomas that we see in Costello syndrome, but still nonetheless, it's something that's very special to neurofibromatosis. And there are other features involved in neurofibromatosis. These, these individuals can have um, learning difficulties. They can have GI problems, including constipation, decrease in bone density. Um, and Dave Stevenson has that study going on because he studied it in NF1, and he's going to be looking at it in Costello syndrome. High blood pressure and vascular issues, you know, skeletal issues. Sometimes uh, headaches can occur in individuals with NF1. They can sometimes have seizures and hydrocephalus. And just like Costello syndrome, NF1, these individuals can get cancer. And then there's Noonan syndrome. Noonan syndrome um, is very similar to Costello syndrome. It's very difficult to differentiate. Um, it can be for some clinicians, especially early on in childhood. And just like Costello syndrome, individuals with Noonan syndrome can have heart problems. They can have growth and development problems. They can have similar findings um, on MRI. And like Costello syndrome and NF1, these individuals can develop cancer. And then there's capillary malformation, AB malformation. I just want to mention this briefly because it's a syndrome that actually it's a fascinating syndrome that is not getting enough attention that it should, but I think that will change. And this is due to genetic alteration also in the pathway. These individuals can get capillary malformations. A handful of individuals can have heart problems, and some may develop tumors as well. And then there's leg use syndrome. I just wanted to introduce this to the group because it's a syndrome that looks a lot like NF1. And so these individuals can have similar skin findings to NF1. And interestingly enough, there's some of the kids actually look like they have Noonan syndrome. So you can see how there's all of this overlap, all of these feature overlaps from all these different syndromes just because they fall into the same pathway. So here's cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome, which I know most of you know as well. And just like Costello syndrome, these individuals have very characteristic uh, facial features. They can also have heart problems, growth and development issues, special skin issues, and brain uh, structure changes very similar to Costello syndrome. So why has joining the RAS pathway of syndromes, or what I call the RASopathies, how has that really altered the face of Costello syndrome? Well, you've become, um, you've become a part of a much larger community. And although you have your own identity and your own special uniqueness, sometimes it really does take a village to move forward. And because you've become part of a larger group, believe it or not, you have more clout. And when you, when you become part of a larger group, in fact, when you look at the frequency of putting all those syndromes together, this may be one of the largest group of genetic syndromes when you put it all together. That equals clout. And this is Collins' a website. He has put together this international website, this international group of bringing all these syndromes together. And this is so important because together we can move forward faster. 
So in learning about other syndromes in this family of syndromes will help us learn more about Costello syndrome. Again, even though there is uniqueness, because there's so much phenotypic overlap, what is going to be found in one syndrome needs to be looked for in other syndromes that may never have been recognized before. So that's why it's so important. And when you look at other syndromes, what a treatment or a best practice that has been identified for one syndrome may actually apply to Costello syndrome. So that is going to keep the kids healthier and, and make the physicians actually look for newer features that we might have not thought about, but it's been well known in another syndrome. And because of that, because of becoming part of a larger group, you have exponentially expanded your clinical base and your research base. And here's just some examples. So for the last two years in the European meetings of human genetics, there have been, uh, there's been groups that specifically have focused on the RAS pathways, including Costello syndrome. <laughs> And neurofibromatosis 1, the NF group, NF1 is so common in the population that there is already a lot of research and a lot of research money that goes into NF1. And NF1 is realizing that there's other syndromes out there, and they're now starting to learn from us. So we've had special um, sessions in NF conferences that look at the resopathies, including Costello syndrome. And here's another example. There's an entire invited session on uh, the rasopathies in the upcoming Hawaii meeting of human genetics. So again, you now have expanded your base, and there are a lot more doctors and a lot more healthcare providers that are learning about Costello syndrome more than ever. And here's another example. By putting the pathway together, um, new clinics are forming. And we have a clinic at UCSF, we call the NF-RAS Pathway Clinic, and we see all those syndromes that are part of this pathway in this one specialized clinic, where we now take a child, we can transition them in healthcare into adulthood. We have, I think our crowning glory is over 60 physicians that are dedicated in both the pediatric arena and in the adult arena to care for these individuals with RAS syndromes, which includes Costello syndrome. These are experts in the pathway of RAS. And it's a, it's a clinic that's guided by advocacy advisory committee from all the different groups. And we have a scientific advisory board to make sure we're on track and providing the best, best health care to your children. So I just want to end with um, a talk about animal models and what's been going on with Costello syndrome and animal models and why animal models are so important. So animal my models provide us a new understanding and insight for the mechanism of how activated uh, HRAS causes Costello syndrome. Without having animal models, it'd be very, very difficult for us to study this. And it helps us understand how the genetic change affects growth and development. And it also allows us to study the cellular mechanisms at a detail that we could never do, never do um, in humans. And it really does help us begin to examine treatments um, in preclinical models and trials. And currently, just to let you know, that there are two mouse models out there that have been published for Costello syndrome and one zebrafish model that has been um, published um, for Costello syndrome. Now, just to clarify, I just want to add a little footnote, is that some of you may be asking, well, the Costello syndrome model is not a model that is the most common in the genetic change in Costello syndrome. It's the most common genetic change found in cancer, which is very different from the common genetic change found in Costello syndrome. Well, this was a place to start. When, re when researchers heard about the HRAS, genetic change in Costello syndrome, they literally went back to their freezers, got their cancer models, and actually started to look for the developmental consequences of the HRAS genetic change. So that's why they're all G12V as opposed to G12S. But that's a good start. It's not the best, but it's a very, very good start. So just to quickly mention the two publications um, for the Costello syndrome mouse models, 
One from um, uh, the group in Spain, from Barbacet and his group. Um, their mouse model does have some genetic, uh, it has a genetic HRAS change of the uh, G12V, which is different um, from the common Costello syndrome change. But there are some uh, similar features. The genetic, uh, excuse me, the bony facial structure um, is a little different from the wild type mouse. There seems to be some heart issues in the, in the mouse as well, and high blood pressure, which can be treated with a common um, anti-hypertensive drug called Captopril is what they looked at. But what's interesting in their mouse model, their mouse model didn't have any tumor development. So then there was another mouse model that was recently published by uh, Dr. Fagan and his group in New York. And it just had a little different way that it expressed the HRAS gene in the mouse. And it too had bony changes that were similar to the Spanish mouse model. Um, and these um, mice also did develop high blood pressure as well and some cardiac changes. But what's different is their mouse model did develop some tumors, including papillomas. So again, this is a good, a good step to help us um, look at the different changes and to consider different treatment options. And then I do want to mention the Costello syndrome zebrafish model. So zebrafish, you might think, are so far away from mammalian development. Why would they be important? Well, actually, because zebrafish do develop in a very similar fashion to humans, if you can believe it. And you can get a lot of zebrafish very quickly. And so this is um, a zebrafish model with, again, the same more so cancer change. But you can see the difference between the HRAS model and the wild type model. And the HRAS model has a little bit of body coarseness that changes with age. So as the mouse is, or excuse me, as the zebrafish is developing, the body shape changes a little bit. And the body also is a little shortened. There's bony skeletal changes. And the eyes are very wide spaced. So there is some delay in heart development. And they believe that this leads to the enlargement of the heart. And this zebrafish model actually does develop tumors, so it might be very helpful when trying to look at treatments as well. So the good news is that there are treatments out there. This is a very well-studied pathway. There are treatment available, small molecule inhibitors that alter the, the way that the pathway signals. And so these are things that a lot of researchers are very interested in looking at. And here's another example of moving forward um, with regards to clinical trials. And this is something that we've done with, remember, the urine that we're collecting now and the urine that we collected two years ago. So here's an example of looking at the proteins, something called proteomics, where we want to see how does that HRAS change the body compared to, for instance, a sibling. And so looking at the urine of, of Costello syndrome and CFC syndrome and um, sieve controls is that there is a protein change. We're still trying to identify what that protein is, but this might be something called a biomarker that might be very handy when, if we do continue to move towards clinical trials, that this might be something kind of like high glucose, high blood glucose or high cholesterol. That's also a biomarker. So if you've got high glucose or high cholesterol, you change your diet, you go on medicine, you check it again. If it's back in the normal range, you know you're doing a good job. So that's kind of what a biomarker is. So can we identify biomarkers that we can find in the kids that when we treat them, we know we're doing a good job because it goes back to the normal range. So that's the idea. And again, you guys are all making history. You started off with the first Costello Syndrome International um, Research Symposium, and now everyone has come together here today. You guys have all come together with, other, with four other syndromes, with NF1, they're holding a family symposium on Sunday. You've got uh, CFC Syndrome and Noonan Syndrome. All the families have come together around um, an international research symposium, which is taking place this weekend. But basically, really what it is for you, it's the second international Costello Syndrome research group. Because the Costello Syndrome research is going to be looked at in the context of all the other syndromes. And so there, 
even though we have come a long way, there still really is a long road ahead of us. And so here are some goals that maybe we can think about as we continue to move forward. We need to continue spreading the word about Costello syndrome and the rasopathies. By increasing our presence and increasing the research, we'll let everybody know that we're out there, and that's a good place to start. We need to continue learning about the natural history of Costello syndrome, and this is why it's so important to be part of Karen Gripp's study, because she and um, Ginny Proud, along with Ginny Proud, are really looking at how Costello syndrome from child to adulthood, because there might be important markers in there as well. So uh, very important to continue understanding the natural history of Costello syndrome. To continue learning about the biochemical functioning of how the altered RAS protein and how it affects development. Again, it leads back to biomarkers um, and to try to isolate biomarkers that might be helpful for us. And to continue exploring the application of small molecule inhibitors in the pathway. There's a lot of cancer small molecule inhibitors out there that can be very, very well applied to um, the pathway uh, for Costello syndrome. And we need to continue exploring the animal models and again the biomarkers and the clinical trial endpoints that I've already mentioned. And we need to continue learning about other syndromes of this family of, of syndromes um, to help us learn more about Costello syndrome. And absolutely we can do this all together. So thank you very much.